Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with a brief mention of Marcia Strassman, who died recently at the age of 66. Marcia was best known for her role on Welcome Back, Cotter. That was the 1970s sitcom about high school that starred Gabe Kaplan as a high school teacher. It helped make John Travolta a star as Vinnie Barbarino, one of the sweat hogs. And Marcia Strassman actually had a secondary role in the show, which graded on her. She was Gabe Kaplan's wife, and she mostly had to sit around at home waiting for Gabe Kaplan to come home and tell jokes at the end of the show. She didn't like that. There were a lot of reports that she was fighting with Gabe Kaplan, but it turned out later on that she wasn't fighting so much with Gabe Kaplan about an expanded role, but with the executive producer James Comack. And a little while after she started fighting with him and left the show, Gabe Kaplan and John Travolta both started fighting with him and they left the show too, so I think you can pretty much tell who was on what side on that one. Marcia Strassman was actually a pretty good actor. She was born in New York City, and she got her start when she was 15 years old, and she replaced Liza Minnelli in an off-Broadway show. Then she moved on to The Patty Duke Show. The Patty Duke Show was basically the last sitcom to be filmed in New York City. Everything else had moved out to Southern California by 64, 65. Patty Duke was the only one left. And then Marcia moved to Southern California also, and she got a role on MASH in the early 70s as one of the nurses in the 4077. Then she got her big break on Welcome Back, Cotter. And she was also known for for her role as Rick Moranis' wife in the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie series. So I don't think she ever really got the roles that her talent demanded. She was involved in a lot of social causes in Southern California. By every indication, she was a very nice person. But the one aspect of her career that nobody really touched on in her obits was her music career. When she moved from New York to Southern California in 1967, it was at the beginning of the flower power era. The term flower power, by the way, was coined by two guys, Jerry Goldstein and Lord Tim Hudson, and they were writing songs at the time, and a producer named Kim Fowley thought he could take those songs, give them to Marcia Strassman, and make her a rock star. And she actually recorded a couple of songs for him, and one of them did very well on the West Coast, didn't make it nationally. So here is Marcia Strassman with a record she cut in 1967 called The Flower Children. This just reeks of San Francisco and Scott McKenzie. <laughs> Now you get the idea. Kim Fowley, by the way, also produced Like Long Hair, that Paul Revere and the Raiders song we played a couple of weeks back when Paul Revere died. And he was one of the two cats who made up the Hollywood Argyles, who sang Alley, a big hit in 1960, we've closed with. Anyway, Marcia Strassman had enough success with that record that she tried one more in 1968. And she moved from angry protest in 1967 to mellow out in 1968. Oh, down the stream of I don't know, I sort of liked it. Anyway, that's Marcia Strassman's recording career. We're going to move on now to Warren Anderson, who died recently at the age of 92. He was the head of Union Carbide in the 1980s, and normally he wouldn't make this program except he was the head of Union Carbide at the time of the Bhopal Industrial Disaster in Bhopal, India, which killed thousands of people. Union Carbide had majority control of the plant, and many people blamed Warren Anderson for the industrial disaster. In India, he was actually indicted and almost certainly would have been sent to jail. In the United States, they took a more tolerant view because no one ever exactly ascertained the cause for the accident. The disaster was a methyl isocyanate leak, and I actually worked with a law firm that did some of the litigation for that back in 1985. Here's Indian television on the death of Warren Anderson. Well, having escaped multiple calls there for Warren Anderson there to be extradited to India to face prosecution for his role in the Bhopal gas tragedy, which ended up killing 3,787, affected thousands others for generations. The former Union Carbide chief, Warren Anderson, reportedly 
has now passed away. Uh, we should remember uh, Warren Anderson here, the son of a Swedish uh, immigrant, arose from being a sales representative of the Union Carbide to being the chairperson of the company. He was the chairperson of the company here in Bhopal in the wake of that Bhopal gas tragedy. There are multiple efforts uh, that have been made by the government of India to have him extradited here uh, to be tried. Uh, of course, uh, the American courts uh, having denied the American authorities there having denied that extradition. Well, that is completely uh, justice being denied to several of those victims in our country where India had made multiple calls to extradite him to India, but of course to face prosecution for that Bhopal gas tragedy. They left over 4,000 people affected. To review the Bhopal disaster, it was an industrial catastrophe that took place at a pesticide plant owned and operated by Union Carbide in Bhopal, in the state of Madhya Pradesh, India, on December 3rd, 1984. Around midnight, the plant released methyl isocyanate gas and other toxins, resulting in the exposure of over 500,000 people. Estimates vary on the death toll. The official immediate death toll was 2,259, and the government of Madhya Pradesh has confirmed a total of 3,787 deaths related to the gas release. But other government agencies estimate as many as 15,000 deaths and others estimate between 8,000 and 10,000 died within 72 hours, and 25,000 have since died from gas-related diseases and long-term effects. Some 25 years after the gas leak, 390 tons of toxic chemicals abandoned at the Union Carbide plant continue to leak and pollute the groundwater in the region and affect thousands of Bhopal residents who depend on it, though there is some dispute as to whether the chemicals still stored at the site pose any continuing health hazard. For decades, there were civil and criminal cases related to the disaster in the United States District Court in Manhattan and the District Court of Bhopal, India, against Union Carbide, now owned by Dow Chemical Company, and there was a longtime Indian arrest warrant pending against Warren Anderson. The Union Carbide factory was established in 1969 near Bhopal, with 51% owned by Union Carbide Corporation and 49% by various Indian investors including public sector financial institutions. The plant produced the pesticide Carbaryl, which is trademark 7, and in 1979 a methyl isocyanate production plant was added to the site. It was decided to switch to methyl isocyanate, an intermediate Carbaryl manufacturer, to use it instead of less hazardous but more expensive materials. Union Carbide understood the properties of methyl isocyanate and was aware of its special handling requirements. On the night of December 23, 1984, Large amounts of water entered tank 610, containing 42 tons of methyl isocyanate. The resulting exothermic reaction increased the temperature inside the tank to over 392 degrees Fahrenheit, raising the pressure to a level the tank was not designed to withstand. This forced the emergency venting of pressure from the methyl isocyanate holding tank, releasing a large volume of toxic gases into the atmosphere. The reaction sped up because of the presence of iron in the corroding non-stainless steel pipelines. A mixture of poisonous gases flooded the city of Bhopal, causing great panic as people woke up with a burning sensation in their lungs. Thousands died immediately from the effects of the gas, and many more were trampled in the panic. Theories of how the water entered the tank differ. At the time, workers were cleaning out pipes with water, and some claimed that owing to bad maintenance and leaking valves, it was possible for the water to leak into the tank 610. In December of 1985, the New York Times reported that according to Union Carbide plant managers, the hypothesis of this route of entry of water was tested in the presence of the Central Bureau investigators and was found to be negative. Union Carbide also maintains that this route was not possible and that it was an act of sabotage by a disgruntled worker who introduced water directly into the tank. However, the company's investigation team found no evidence of the necessary connection. That 1985 New York Times report presented a picture of what led to the disaster and how it developed, although various parties differ in their details. It's generally agreed that the greatest non-nuclear industrial disaster in the world's history was multifactorial. The factors include the use of extremely hazardous chemicals like methyl isocyanate instead of less dangerous ones, storing these chemicals in large tanks instead of over 200 steel drums, a possible corrosion material in the pipelines, poor maintenance after the plant ceased production in the early 1980s, and the failure of several safety systems, some due to poor maintenance and regulations, and others being switched off to save money, including the methyl isocyanate tank refrigeration system, 
which alone would have prevented the disaster by cooling the reaction. Well, Warren Anderson showed a lot of public contrition after the Bhopal incident, but obviously the government of India wasn't buying it, and it was the defining episode in his career. I'd also like to point out it's just another one of those accidents like Chernobyl that happened at night, and because of that, you wonder how much it caught everybody on site off guard. We're going to move on now to Bernard Mays, who died recently at the age of 85. Bernard Mays was actually a pretty interesting guy. He was an Episcopal priest from Britain. He was gay, and he came to the United States in the 50s to work with students from NYU. And then in the early 60s, he made it out to San Francisco. Now, you know if somebody's going out to San Francisco in the early 60s, they're going to have an interesting story. And sure enough, Bernard Mays did. He was doing commentary about San Francisco for the BBC, and the son of one of his friends committed suicide, which prompted him to create the first suicide hotline in the United States. Here's San Francisco Television to talk about him. A San Francisco man called the founding force behind the suicide prevention movement in America has died. Bernard Mays created the first crisis hotline in San Francisco in the early 60s. His work built the foundation for a network of more than 500 health centers across the country. He won a Bay Area Jefferson Award in 2010 and was selected as a silver medalist, one of only five among the year's winners. Mays was 85 years old. After that, Bernard Mays became one of the founders of National Public Radio in the late 1960s. And here he tells the story of how it began. Because I'd been engaged with BBC, I was invited by President Johnson's Great Society organizers to get involved in what he what was then called public broadcasting and so they hauled me over to Washington and I became a founding chairman of National Public Radio and we put it all together and we tried to make sure that it was an agent for change that's what we were talking about Johnson was saying the same thing very political of course my feeling was that it was very important to establish an improvement in communication Throughout the country, we don't talk enough. Bernard Mays, founder of the Suicide Hotline, one of the founders of National Public Radio. And I got to tell you, after some of those NPR pledge drives, I could use a suicide hotline. We're going to close tonight with Mr. Bernard Stanley Acker Bilk, who died recently at the age of 85. He was British, and Acker was the Somerset term for mate. He was a jazz clarinetist, part of the trad jazz movement of the early 60s in Britain. His clarinet playing was distinct because he lost two front teeth in a schoolyard fight and lost part of a finger while sledding. And he is responsible for one of the biggest songs of the 20th century. It was, in fact, the biggest song of the year in 1962 in both Great Britain and the United States. It's instantly recognized. Eugene Cernan took it on the command module of Apollo 10. It is, of course, Stranger on the Shore. Here, 50 years later, Eckerbilt talks about that memorable song. You're sitting there at the piano, you're playing around, you're coming up with lots of ideas, and then Stranger on the Shore comes out. Did you immediately think, that's special? No, not really. No, I didn't, I didn't think it was much different than any of the rest of it. It was just a thing come out of my head, that's all. I didn't sort of work on it or do much at all with it. I have a dozen things I've, I've written down, but this was a lucky one, I suppose. Is it your favourite song of of all the songs that you've written? No, I'm fed up with playing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you call it Strangler on the Floor. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah, it's all right, but I mean, you, get, you do get fed up with it after a bit, after about 30, 40, 50 years, is it? At the time of writing the song, Acker can hardly have imagined the huge global success it would achieve. Tell me about how you felt when it started to really hit the heights in the States. Well, it didn't bother me that much because we were working a lot in them days. We were playing every night. I didn't have much time to think about much. And they said it's gone, I don't know what number it was, pretty high up in America. I said, well, that's good. Good, keep them going. And then you got the news it had got to number one in America. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, it got to number one. That must have been a pretty big deal. Yeah, that, 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 I didn't we'll go over the moon about it, but that's all right. No. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. Well, the Beatles may have been coming, but they weren't here yet. And if you were listening to your radio in 1962, you couldn't help but hear this song, Stranger on the Shore by Acker Bilk. <laughs> Thank you.